Hanno will talk to us today under the topic creation under a curse, useful or useless, how to demystify a creative process. And we will gather the questions at the end of Hanno's speech. So I welcome you, Hanno. Juste deux mots en français. Quelqu'un est venu tout à l'heure me demander, euh, puisque nous sommes ici au musée Sibelius, euh, me féliciter pour le fait que je vais tenir mon speech en français. Eh bien, malheureusement, ce ne sera pas le cas. J'ai écrit mon speech en, en anglais. Uh, uh, someone came and asked, uh, 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 was so happy that uh, since we are in the uh, Sibelius Museum, I'm going to uh, give my speech in uh, French. Uh, but that will not be the case. So, um, this is, um, I'm awfully embarrassed because I've never been in front of uh, this kind of uh, scientific and uh, educated audience. And since I was so, um, I'm just an artist and a painter and author. So I have written a seven page speech, uh, I guess for the first time in my life. Uh, so I ask a lot of indulgence, and uh, as uh, uh, you heard, uh, my personal wish is that you would let me <laughs> kindly read my text from the beginning uh, until the bitter end, and then uh, uh, any interactive uh, activity is really welcome, if you don't mind. Ladies and gentlemen, before penetrating the dark tunnels of creation under curse, I would like us to listen to a little piece of music, just to present you an artist, a composer, whose importance is undeniable, but a, comp a composer often ignored only because he is not associated with any artistic tragedy or any curse, anything shaped of suffering. If we don't pay any attention to the fact that the wife of uh, this composer hated music, and if we forget the, the little detail that this composer lost his head only two years after his death, and got his cranium back only 150 years after he was buried. His name is Joseph Haydn. Here comes the beginning, beginning passage uh, of his overture for Isola Inabitata, uh, and with the um, um, beginning little uh, video, um, a clumsy video made by, by myself, you will be reading, you can read some verses of Rimbaud, and we'll talk about Rimbaud then later.
So Rambo said in this uh, text, uh, which uh, uh, is the beginning of his poem, uh, Om Juste. I am cursed, you know. I am drunk, crazy, livid, whatever you want. But go to bed right away, just man. I want nothing from your torpid brain. Ever since uh, the uh, romantic artist hero was accepted as a common norm in Western civilization, all the preconceptions linked to this norm have spread uh, in the collective consciousness and they have become almost facts. The curse uh, seems to be as much moral and spiritual and social uh, contributing to the presumption that the true artist must suffer agonies of genius. Often, perhaps too often, we still hear these current set phrases. An artist is equal to a mobile disaster. Or a real poet is always banned by the mighty ones plus an endless list of other clichés. Are these miserable adhesives uh, on artists' front head here to stay? And will the artist of the future carry this yoke left behind by the Romantic era? The prototypes of uh, a cast, accursed artists uh, were born in early 19th century France. Most of us remember the pitiful trio Baudelaire, Verlaine and Rimbaud. There were others as well, of course, before and after, but these three uh, may suffice to explain when talking about the term poet maudit, cursed poet. Their curse, either intentional or unintentional, gives a good example to the whole school. These words, intentional and unintentional, are going to be, whenever, if, if we have a possibility to discuss the matter, then after my uh, speech, they are one of the key words, possibly. Even though I mention, uh, even though I mention here um, several artists and poets by name, it does not have anything to do with my personal opinions, and this is important, my personal opinions about their art. My point is not in their artistic quality, but in those clichés we still cherish concerning these artists. The case of Baudelaire. Um, what do we know about Baudelaire? Of course, an important poet of the flowers of evil, who lived a scandalous life from the beginning to the end. A man who hated bourgeoisie as much as he hated dentists. A man who never smiled, probably because he hated dentists, and adored Edgar Allan Poe, another real prototype of cursed artist. Baudelaire believed, like any others uh, at his time, the rumors about Poe's excessive use of alcohol and his intentional misery. These rumors were, of course, widely exaggerated, but Baudelaire did not want a sober, neatly cut Poe. He needed a real weakling. This is how legions and myths get started. Baudelaire's version of Poe's life, which is in large part Baudelaire's own imagination, became a bohemian credo. Then there was Verlaine. Verlaine himself happened to be about as cursed as they come, alcoholic, wife-beater, child-abuser, 
jailbird, syphilitic, down and outer. In no small part, because of Verlaine's own harrowing life, the meaning of modi has come to include not only the troubles such poets suffer from society, but also the troubles nature inflicts on them and the ones they inflict on themselves. Then if nature inflicts on them, How natural is uh, artist aggressive behavior? Several times uh, Verlaine tried to set his wife's hair on fire. And if we have to believe on Verlaine's own confessions, he also picked up, picked up his um, three-month-old boy and hurled him against the wall. And this he did uh, to follow Baudelaire's heroism and in order to understand completely what it means to be a cursed uh, uh, poet. When, uh, when uh, Verlaine was put into prison after having shot uh, Rimbaud during a quarrel, he lived through a kind of um, religious conversion and finally praised the prison where his soul was put right. Rambo, as, uh, uh, Rambo, as um, many of us may remember, was a long-term lover of Verlaine. Their relationship uh, was filled with quarrels and fervent love. After one of these famous quarrels, Rambo said he was leaving Verlaine for good, and Verlaine shot him in the wrist. Rimbaud arrived uh, uh, to Verlaine's arms at the age of 16 and left him at the age of 20. He stopped writing about the same time. After wandering around for some time, Rimbaud became a merchant in East Africa, infamously running guns and uh, 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 running guns to a uh, savage uh, warlord, and when needed, he was also a s slave trader and had slaves uh, in his own household. This sounds, of course, like a bad fairy tale, very short, though, of a candid young man who writes verses like when shall we go beyond the shores and the mountains to salute the birth of the new work, the new wisdom, the flight of tyrants and demons, the end of superstition to celebrate the first Christmas on earth, the song of the heavens, the march of peoples, slaves, let us not curse life. Slaves, let us not curse life. This is, um, how do you call it, a receipt of the tra um, uh, slavery and the gun uh, trade market in, um, um, in East Africa, signed by Rambo at 18. 89. After running guns uh, in East Africa and working for different European colonialists, after years of, years of uh, endless and hopeless errantry, Rambo became seriously ill. He was brought back to France. A terrible illness perhaps a kind of a bone cancer, ate into his leg. He was transferred, transferred in, into a hospital in Marseille where amputation was performed. It did not save him. He died in Marseille at the age of 37. 
And once again, in his poem, which I already uh, read, uh, Rambo says, um, I think it's so important, I, s I still read it once. I am cursed. I am drunk, crazy, livid, whatever you want, but go to bed right away, just men. I want nothing from your torpid brain. Beautiful and strong lies, lines, perhaps, and yet so typically romantic. The self-writer's congratulates himself of not having a torpid brain himself and of being cursed and thus anointed. During the peak of um, a romantic era, this pronounced individuality to differ from the masses, enmity towards the bourgeoisie, love suicides and such, were the rules, uh, at least for those who wanted to become legions. It was a period all over the Europe, an era which uh, emph uh, emphasized perhaps more than any, any other period before and after, that's my personal opinion, uh, the difference between exceptional heroic per persons and masses. And if one talks about exceptional persons, one must also talk about heroes and heroic artists. The epithet on heroic artist evokes immediately images of tortured souls, unfortunate creators, beaten by shameful illnesses, damaged by alcohol, uh, uh, creatures visiting obscure places, walking always at the edge of ravine, haunted by their vocation, and often creators who don't succeed in meeting nothing else but the lack of judgment, at least during their lifetime. Baudelaire and his disciples were to shout out loud, I have the ecstasy and terror of a chosen one. Evil in me must have a voice. Since the evil wants to speak, and since the evil wants to speak, he must be nourished properly. There has been and there will always be among us more or less heroic and misunderstood artists. There are those crushed by general indifference, great poets, authors, composers, painters, who did not search for, uh, who did not uh, search nor wished for the curse, uh, any kind of curse. The list of these artists is very long. But one has to be able to distinguish a cursed poet who provides himself the execration from those who wished for something else from, uh, from their uh, contemporaries. I suppose every country on this earth has a stain, has a stain uh, uh, on, on their reputation. Only to mention Alexis Kivi in Finland, Heinrich von Kleist in Germany, Bela Bartok in Hungary, uh, Dylan Thomas somewhere between uh, England and the United States, Anton Webern in Austria, and so on. You may have noticed that I speak, that I only speak of men. It sounds like the curse would never hit women. Is the poet Modi a privilege of men. We seldom hear stories about female artists under curse, or they are at least less famous. We seldom... Uh, this, of course, has a very simple explanation. It is only from the beginning of the 20th century that female artistic activities were 
have been more widely known and supported. I would like to talk in this context about one French sculpture, Camille Claudel. She was uh, Rodin's student and later his mistress. After several trials to show her independent, undeniable qualities of an artist, which were not accepted, she was shut up in a mental hospital. Uh, Camille Claudel's famous brother, Paul Claudel, poet and a playwright, writer, uh, was very active in confining his sister in a straight jacket. The family, especially the brother and some authorities, thought a mental hospital was the best rem remedy to extinguish Camille Claudel's enthusiasm and artistic ambitions. Anyway, it was not suitable at that time for a woman to model naked male bodies in clay. Entirely sane, as we know today, uh, Camille Claudel died uh, of the illness caused of uh, undernutrition in an insane asylum at uh, Mont de Vergue at the age of 78, after spending 30 years in different mental hospitals. Then Fanny Mendelssohn, the musically gifted sister of Felix Mendelssohn, was prevented entirely of becoming a professional composer like her brother. Her father dictated the destiny by saying this to, to his daughter. Music might become a real profession for Felix, but what comes to you, it can only be, it should only be a kind of sweetness. A normal family cannot hold two composers. It was also considered necessary to erase Fanny's name from some of her early song cycles and replace it by the signature of Felix Mendelssohn. These stories of um, woman artists living in the shadow of their brothers, husbands, lovers, and so on, is endless. I only mention one more, since I think it is so indicative. We all know, or I suppose most of you know, the name of Jackson Pollock, uh, a great American painter. But only a few remember that Pollock's, Pollock had a wife, also a great American painter, Lee Krasner. In order not to um, disturb the dawning fame of her husband, she did not paint at all, or did not show at all her paintings in public. So she little by little became just a Mrs. Pollock. As late as um, 1938, an art critic said, after having seen some of the works of Lee Krasner, these are so good, you would not know they were painted by a woman. For years, um, the name Lee Krasner didn't mean a lot in art world. A dedicated painter herself, she was much better known as Mrs. Jackson Pollock, and for too long after his death as Lee Krasner Pollock, the, the artist's widow. There were even those who said that she couldn't get a show were it not for the Pollock collection, connection, a whispering campaign of which Krasner was bitterly aware. Yet she kept on painting, and she had always done, 
and gradually her work and her name emerged from the background to which her husband's fame had consigned it. In the name of impartiality, anyhow, I have to mention that prejudges concerning uh, Lee Krasner's artistic capacity never came from her husband, but from the American society and American arts life. These artists mentioned above are not examples of what I call for a cursed artist, artist under curse, but ill-fated, talented creators. They were not chasing after suffering. They did not see themselves as prophets or tragic heroes. The evil of their everyday life was sufficient. Uh, there is, of course, another idée reçue, preconception concerning the artistic creation. I would call it uh, uh, the fascination of insanity. I seriously think that we should begin to demystify the madness so often associated with artists. The persistent idea of an artist representing madness or insanity has become rooted so deeply in our collective knowledge that it is hard to believe that there are still good artists driving cars, go in for sports, fill in their tax returns, and cleaning their houses without being more burgers, bourgeois, than any other citizens among us. Why do we still love the combination artist-madness? Why should we glorify artists' madness and at the same time forget all those individuals in mental hospitals whose sufferings are real but who never composed any symphony nor wrote any novel? Those people might have all the artistic attributes according to our preconceptions, but no way to canalize their, these attributes. I do not know whether the era of cursed artists is over. Of course, I hope so. The number of artists, all the artists, of, uh, all the art fields together is e increasing in a high speed. All Western societies seem to be more tolerant toward artists. Artist professions have become an acceptable, as acceptable as any other. Parents send voluntarily their children to art schools. The number of applicants seeking admission to art schools all over the world is in, uh, increasing increasing explosively. The high value of arts as a part of our everyday richness has become also a norm. But there are still those, there are still those who rather talk about Vincent van Gogh's cut ear than go and look at his paintings. Why should we still need any cursed artist in our contemporary context? Why some of us still want to hear some psych psychiatrists and psychologists in TV programs such as uh, the Jeremy Kyle show, uh, famous TV show in, in Britain, insisting that even the modern society needs a tragic artist heroes as examples of license. In my mind, if modern psychiatry or some of its popular media representatives need tragic artist heroes, psychiatry goes back to the level of uh, pseudoscience and continue the job of those quack doctors 
who considered that the best place for Camille Claudel was a lunatic asylum. I think we should not forget that the biggest part of artists, writers, and composers, their everyday livelihood is really precarious. And paying attention to the fact that the number of artists is increasing all around the world, the, uh, there will be less and less of those who only amass diamonds. There are also, and this is, I think, quite important, there are also a lot of artists, poets, filmmakers, and so on, who come from Uh, sorry, there are also a lot of artists, poets, filmmakers, and so on, who for different, often dramatic reasons, have to leave their home countries and emigrate wherever in order to continue their creative work. This migration of the artist will surely be one of the biggest changes in the arts, art fields of the future. These artists coming out of a chaotic situation will probably not be praised. These artists coming out from chaotic situation will probably not be praising the curse as their first need. Multi-ethnicity and interaction of different outlooks of the world will also change our conceptions of individualism. There is something which strikes me always when reading the history of art, not only Western history of art. I find only a few or none examples of cursed artists or their idealization in Asian art history, in different Asian countries. Of course, there, are, there were poor artists and blind musicians in Asia as well, but the drama of the artist in, history, in a historical sense seems to be different. And I'm uh, certainly not talking about today's China and its violation of human rights. The basic difference, in my mind, seems to be the absence of dichotomy. The Western idea of opposites creating energy. In most Asian civilizations, opposites do not fight one against another, but merge into each other. Black ink is bright, and even severe gods have laughing faces. One would think that um, a writer such as Yokio Mishima would be an example of a Japanese cursed artist, only because he committed uh, uh, seppuku, suicide in a public place. But his real intentions at that moment were not so much in arts, but the question of nationality and the pride of historical values of Japan, and above all in restoring the power of the emperor. He was a master of kendo and other martial, martial arts. His passionate bodybuilding activity his posing almost nude to different photographers, his extreme military self-discipline take him far away from Baudelaire's ideals. If there is a heaven, I don't know if there is a heaven, but if there is a heaven for all these artists and writers, I wonder how angrily Baudelaire is staring at Yokio Mishima's neatly cut nails while, uh, finally, Camille Claudel is finally able to draw a model of a perfect male nude. Though I really, I don't really believe in uh, 
uh, this common uh, juxtaposition, east, west, there are anyhow some interesting differences, especially when talking about creativity. One may find differences in attitudes towards the emptiness, our horror vacui and the um, eastern um, emptiness, and different notions of time and space. But the essential difference might be here. First, the Western attitude. Wisdom and art come from suffering. This current phrase we have heard and read from all those thick Western books aiming to make us more obedient and serious. How refreshing, then, it is to read these lines from Upanishad, the collection of philosophical texts uh, which create the base of uh, Hindu religion. I'll read it first and then we'll look at the final video. From joy comes all creation. By joy it is sustained. Towards joy it proceeds, and to joy it returns. Let us now exit finally the dark tunnel of curse and cursed artists. Let us go back to Haydn. Once again, I suggest us to listen to this beautiful passage of Haydn's symphony number 44, E minor, called The Morning. This is important when you listen to the music. Uh, don't forget the title of this symphony, it's Morning. Uh, late in his life, Haydn asked uh, for the slow movement of this symphony to be played at his funeral. Here it will be played by uh, Philip, uh, Carl Philipp uh, Emanuel Bach's chamber orchestra, conducted by Hartmund Henschen and illustrated with a modest video made by, by, by myself. My final question might be, has any morning ever been more luminous when listening to this Haydn's
just one little detail. Some of you uh, in the beginning of my uh, presentation uh, heard that uh, Haydn lost his head, and if you don't know the story, so I, um, I try to uh, tell it um, as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, the um, 19th century Europe, there was a, a pseudo science called phrenomenology. Uh, 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 studying uh, different forms of uh, human crane. Uh, uh, um, and that's why two years after Haydn was buried, they took uh, his body out of the grave and uh, saw off his head, and then the head disappeared for 150 years. Uh, because these phrenomenologists, they wanted to study uh, different forms of uh, this genius uh, uh, thinking that uh, uh, that's uh, uh, to recognize future uh, big composers by studying his head. And uh, then uh, no one knew uh, where the head was during 150 years. Then it stayed in the uh, Munich, uh, uh, Vienna, it's not the State Museum, I don't remember the name of the museum, for tw tw 20 years. And then only 1945, his uh, mausoleum was opened and uh, um, Haydn got back his own head. That was, I thought it was important to mention this little detail. Okay. So he was not cursed at all. <laughs> say a great thank you to Hannu Väisänen for inviting us into this uh, and also questioning the world of curses and agony and madness in the creative process in different times and different cultures and also by presenting your own original artworks to this audience we are very thankful. Thank you. Now, there is plenty of time for questions, discussions, comments. So I will now open the floor. So please address your questions. Uh, I will ju jump to the, <laughs> to, the, to the opportunity of thanking you at first for the wonderful lecture, but then also ask you to come back to, to what you said in the beginning of your speech that you would like to discuss the intentional and the unintentional. unintentional yes. and, and my reflection leading to this, when you spoke about the different types of situations for creative yes. artists of both genders, you did it very beautifully. But when you mentioned the word a pitiful trio, of course I think of a, quite another trio, and you can know the three women in Yorkshire that I'm thinking of, the three very romantic uh, and self-confident artists. But of course, there's uh, outer situation was perhaps the thing that, that make it very different from the French trio somewhat earlier. But, but, but you have, I think, it's important to remember, you talked about the, the Swedish the sculpture. French, French, yes, French sculpture. Yes, uh, yes. Coming Swedish, Florida, Swedish, Swedish, everything goes around here. Yes. Uh, but I'm thinking about all the great novelists, how, of, female novelists of the 18th century. Yes. In Scandinavia, not the, for the least, how many of them, uh, the main topic was suffering. You have the Norwegian Amalie Skram, for instance, exactly, and you yes. have all these, and they end in suicides, 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 suicides. Yes. So you have this theme, which of course is connected to the reality of women and, and, and being not allowed, perhaps. The important, I think, is to, uh, to, to make a difference be between uh, uh, whether cursed, uh, did they really search it for, for themselves, uh, uh, or was it uh, the conditions of the yes, society exactly. and society not ac accepting their artistic uh, activity exactly. whatsoever? Exactly. And, and in, I mean, in the last century we have this 
big mythology about the, the modernist poet in Finland, Edith Södergran, made exactly. a, a very suffering person. And now today, gradually we see that perhaps she was very joyful. <laughs> it was so that's sad. That's quite true. Yeah. Uh, 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 I think I read an article about her uh, uh, when this new book about yes, uh, exactly. Edith Södergran yes, came out. That just appeared Ch last year. Just a few, yes, yeah, yes. okay. <laughs> But uh, but what I wanted you uh, to talk more about then is this uh, the outer <laughs> space and your inner space, and you talked about the the s suffering artist connected to one's own image of being a hero or a heroine, mm. and and that perhaps lo looked very different for for women and ma men then. So more simply more <laughs> of your talks. Thank you. Uh, well, it's, uh, to me, it seems to be. It, we have to precise first uh, which uh, um, which part of the world are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about the conditions in Turku or in Libya? It's uh, it's uh, the difference is uh, or in any um, I don't know India, Eastern Asia, and so on, uh, Japan. Where I go quite often is uh, uh, there are um, great pearls of uh, uh, Japanese uh, literature have been written by women living courts, like Lady Muragami and uh, others. Uh, the situation is so different in their, in their case. Uh, so that's why, I mean, dealing uh, 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 whether uh, the curse hits more often men or women and the gender, uh, I first have to ask, at least I'm, I'm asking myself, which part of the world are we talking about? And even today, I mean, it really, uh, things might have changed here in Turku, but uh, uh, it's all, it seems that things go also worse in some places, such as Saudi Arabia, or where women don't have uh, driving licenses, for instance. Uh, first, a small note. Brain imaging is a modern form of phrenology in many ways. A lot of wasted uh, so-called scientific work is done just by publishing those photos, 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 what happens, where, where, where. Now, my question is, cursed by whom or what? Cursed by whom or what? That is also, that, uh, the, the question would be intentional or unintentional. They, uh, like in Baudelaire's case, it's, it, he, was, he wanted to be cursed by himself. He chose it, and he thought that it, it is a heroic method. Uh, 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 for instance, to live uh, with a prostitute to get a sy uh, good syphilis. That was his method. And uh, um, idealizing, uh, 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 for instance, uh, um, I mentioned Edgar Allan Poe, and Baudelaire, uh, uh, since Baudelaire, Baudelaire thought that uh, he, he was a real prototype of a cursed artist. But nowadays, as we know better about um, um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, life, uh, his misery was, uh, was not uh, intentional, not, not as much as uh, Baudelaire thought. So you are asking, uh, curse by what and uh, by, by whom? Uh, I guess in, um, in the, as, as I say, the, this, uh, this miserable trio, uh, Baudelaire, Baudelaire, at least Baudelaire and uh, and Verlaine, um, uh, they probably thought that it comes somewhere from the heaven because they uh, had um, some, um, how should I say, religious uh, aspects in their in their in their work, and uh, um, I suppose also a kind of a belief in in God. Uh, uh, Verla, uh, uh, Rambo was an atheist, a pre really, a, uh, uh, in the sense as we know. But he also changed a lot uh, during those uh, years, more than 30 years in Eastern Africa. Uh, he didn't 
uh, he gave Im entirely uh, up uh, the ideas of, uh, of cursed artist. And um, for instance, he, uh, he never came back before he, 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 he was seriously ill and he was brought back to France. But he didn't want to come to ba back to France uh, because he wanted to be rich enough to be able to get married in a normal bo a Burgess uh, uh, style. And uh, uh, in one of his letters, it's like really remarkable that he says that, I wouldn't want to be a good father to a son. And that's once again, that's a, a gender thing. To a son, he says, no, not, not to a daughter. I found it very fascinating what you have been telling us. And I quite agree with this uh, uh, trying to de demystify the fascination of madness because uh, it's when you look at all these artists uh, it really comes to a lot of misery and uh, I wouldn't all that categorically call it intentional I don't know very much about Verlaine Verlaine's personal history, but at least uh, if you look at background and family history and uh, all, all the things that add up to a sort of self-destructive pattern, uh, it's, uh, it's not necessarily something you choose. Of course, there is this uh, romantic myth that yes. underblows and makes the male artist like later the male rock musician and the self-destructiveness of the that kind of life seem in some ways glorious. But uh, uh, what I wanted to say was that there is a lot of research in in the psychopathology of artists and it seems that the most one of the most dangerous occupations you might hold is that of being a prose writer where the uh, in some studies of course this is western like american and european studies and meta studies in some uh, some have come to 60% of depression in prose writers and playwriters and mm -hmm. poets a little bit lower. There's also some uh, evidence that the reason people are able to create uh, in spite of all these mental problems is that they tend to have more uh, some uh, something you might call ego strength or holding together and although creation is quite taxing and stressful work it also may provide an outlet mm. often writers get really sick when they aren't able to create like Stig Dagerman, for example, mm, yes. whom we heard about yesterday. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to complicate the picture a little. Yes, so it's not complicating. That's a, actually, there's a yes. uh, really in, interesting and important aspect of uh, mm. uh, uh, you mentioned about writers, authors, and playwriters, and uh, mm. uh, mainly writers. I, I'm a writer, author myself, and plus on that, I'm a painter. Uh, which means that I have to, I, I, you, I work long, really very long periods, all by myself, all alone. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, loneliness without any communication, without yes. any uh, regular rep rep response to, to anything what we create, is one uh, quite serious fact to some persons, uh, because it really needs discipline to uh, to stay alone, because it just happens to be the fact that when, when I 
uh, now I'm writing my next uh, novel, which is uh, supposed to be published next year, uh, which, which means that there are periods going from one month to three months that I'm uh, uh, in my countryside place in France, all alone, talking to myself, and, but not, uh, uh, not getting mad. <laughs> I'm, I am absolutely sure I'm trying to demystify the, the need of being mad. I don't need to be mad to be. Well, it might be that I'm a, uh, the, um, the basic, uh, basically a mediocrity. That's, that's why I'm so sane. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is to bring in tomorrow, actually, and also a couple of matters, because you know uh, a so-called film genius died yesterday, committed suicide, Robin Williams. And yes. tomorrow he got green away. Yes. And I think uh, somewhere in here you said that you think the cursed artist may be dying out or, or going away. But here, and you said that you prepared your, your speech, so I've prepared my question. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, would you say that the reason there are extraordinary and gifted creative minds is actually because their brains are chemically formed differently? So that actually, they're different from ordinary people. Um, they see life differently. So actually, they're always going to be cursed. Because that's how they express themselves. The curse of being different, their brains have been formed differently, chemically, is what brings them to need to create. How would you respond? I'm afraid I'm, I don't quite agree. I, I think my head is, uh, uh, was created like any other head. It, it's, uh, uh, that, it, that would also be a question of talent and, and uh, talented and wh where the, uh, uh, the possibilities to create come from. I, I also think it's a, a um, um, kind of a gift to, uh, of combinations and not only a, a physical structure of brains. Uh, if we had, uh, um, I don't know why. It's probably because I, um, I'm active in, the, in these two uh, sections. I'm, I'm writing and, and, and painting. For me to to stay alive or and to to have a normal uh, 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 interactive uh, communication with uh, with the world around me. It is really important that, that, that uh, my brain capacity stays, stays uh, entire and not... Uh, I mean, I'm not um, searching for any kind of a curse myself. Uh, and um, probably I'm mainly asking that what, is the, uh, what are the artists in future? What, what, what are they going to be like? Uh, uh, do, do we still need this kind of... Uh, um, does uh, an artist of the future, does he have to be entirely different from, uh, from uh, other people without having any uh, the, the burgers, the uh, bourgeois frame around them? Um, and also, probably I might be asking about, um, I was talking about an um, um, increasing number of artists going to art schools and, and the uh, um, society accepting uh, more and more artists and uh, uh, parents sending their children to art schools. Uh, as uh, in my childhood in early 50s, uh, it was not so normal. It was not at all normal to, uh, that a child would uh, had an idea of becoming an artist. It was really a severe, uh, how should I say, uh, image of the future for this child. And I think a lot of things have changed. So that makes me think what is, what, what is going to happen in, say, in next 20, 30, 50 years. I don't know. I don't know because there are so many tendencies. Once again, I, I say that the, the tendencies are so different depending on which place of the earth we're talking about. Finland, France, you probably could uh, compare those, but you cannot compare uh, Finland and uh, 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 
um, Indonesia. Uh, I'm almost ashamed. I have a rather brutal question after your oh. very beautiful lecture. Um, let's assume that you have a young artist in front of you, or a person who wants to become an artist, mm. and this person talks that about making a commercial success on the highly commercialized art market in the Western world. And then the question to you from this young person is, should I add some intentional curse into my portfolio in order to make success? <laughs> Well, I suppose once asking that question, you already know my answer. Uh, uh, I probably would ask why, a com uh, why becoming a co commercial artist? Why do you want to? Uh, are you sure? Where, where, where will you find the, the clients for your paintings? You were talking about painter or, or a writer, or an artist, whatsoever. Yeah, museums, for instance. Uh, that will be a, uh, uh, I'm not a fortune teller, and I, I probably would say uh, I, I hope you will not do anything of what you mentioned there. Uh, everything depends on, depends on so many things, and if you are really, if you think that, well, on the other hand, I should, um, let's not be shy, uh, when I was eight, eight about eight years or seven or eight years old, uh, uh, and uh, um, first or second year in the school in uh, in Oulu, in my uh, native town, I uh, uh, in the beginning of school in September, I went in front of the whole school and I said, "I only have one information to tell you: I am an artist." <laughs> <laughs> so. I didn't say I'm a cursed artist, but I am an artist. And let us, you all shall go out because the, during the next, uh, what is Valitunti in uh, English? I don't, uh, I'm going to make uh, the first portrait of uh, my teacher. <laughs> so I, uh, um, what comes to your question, uh, I think I should first tell this story and then say that don't, don't be so sure about the, the possibilities of... Uh, and uh, first of all, don't put the, uh, in the, on, your, on your CV, don't put the uh, I'm a cursed, art, cursed artist, it's, uh, it's not necessary. It was necessary in the 8th, 19th century, France probably, but not, not any longer. Anyway, it, it will not help. And, uh, this, uh, I should probably also work the importance of the work, working itself. We so seldom talk about the work and the activity. It really, when you're writing or when you're painting, it, uh, it needs a lot of concentration. Uh, works must be redone and uh, rewritten and uh, uh, repainted and so on. And these are also very important questions. Not only just talking about um, uh, exceeding uh, use of alcohol. Um, and of course, we, uh, it was so um, idealized, the idea that people could uh, work under, uh, um, under drugs, I mean, all kinds of drugs. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, they seldom, it seldom becomes anything of a, when you're really pissed, I mean, uh, you hardly can, at least you hardly can paint, or probably you can paint, but not write, and then you'll be ashamed of the results next day anyway. Ah, monsieur, qui voulait que je parle en français? Oh, thank you indeed for your very inspiring and, of course, brilliant presentation. Uh, I have simply one quick uh, historic historical remark um, just to frame uh, the emergence of the notion of the poet Modi. We are uh, uh, historically in the 19th century France 
in which the country was still in situation of acute class tension between a, de a declining, deeply rooted aristocracy and uh, a rising and arrogant bourgeoisie further strengthening itself through the colonial adventure. So one cannot understand the, right, the rise of the poet Modi represented by the trilogy Charles Baudelaire, Paul Verlaine, et Arthur Rimbaud without remembering the peculiar and effervescent historical context uh, France was crossing. Mm. So you see it's a banal remark, but it's good to keep it in mind. It's, it's really good to keep that in mind, but uh, it's almost the same uh, lines that happened all around Europe, in Germany, uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, aristocracy and uh, uh, bourgeoisie uh, and their increasing power, and the, um, uh, how should you say, uh, uh, how artists had to be against that, that, that sort of uh, uh, development. Uh, that also, of course, happened in Germany and uh, I suppose in uh, several other countries. I don't know if it, it was really the, uh, the most powerful development in France compared to other countries, but that sort of story is one could uh, uh, tell about fin Finland, which, which was not Finland at the time, that was, we were still under uh, Swedish reign. Yes, uh, thank you. I would like to stay the 19th century France, and the origin of this uh, poet Modi. And, um, and I was just thinking about, about the, uh, uh, the author, Joris Carl Huysman, who is, I think, best known for his Arrebour novel. And, um, and in his case, I think he's, he started his career as uh, endeavoring to become a poet Modi, and very much following the footsteps on, of, of, of Baudelaire and, and others. But as, as you sh certainly know, he, he later became a very strict Catholic author and, and wrote a, th a trilogy, I think, of, of novels on, in, 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 in yes. after his conversion. So uh, uh, what, uh, what I'm thinking about him is that, at least in his case, the, uh, the, uh, the, the need to become a poet mundi was very much linked with Catholicism. And also, when he had become a strict Catholic, he was very interested in the, in the idea of, of, of uh, suffering. And one of his favorite ideas at, at, during his last decades was, I think, that the more you suffer, the more you actually save the world, because there is a certain amount of suffering around the world, and the more you suffer, the less the others have to suffer. Now, uh, I'm not going to speak any, any more about Joris Calvisman, but, but I was thinking about uh, Baudelaire, whom you, you spoke about. Mm. Do you th would you think that there is still a kind of a very, very much a religious ideology behind this myth of genius and, and the suffering of genius and getting a syphilis for, uh, for, by, by a prostitute? I mean, this kind of Id idea that, that you uh, descend into the deep mud of sin in order to to raise up as a savior. I would see there's, there is something similar between his uh, idea of, of, let's say, sinning, if we take the word from, from re religious discourse, in, in a way, sinning in order to shine as an artist, exactly, of course. Exactly, yes. yes. Yeah, so so you'd, you'd also see, say that there is a certain amount of, of religious thought and perhaps even Catholicism in, in this ideology. I think um, uh, in... Uh, you probably know the, uh, also the, uh, the, the, word, the term uh, uh, Poet Modi comes from uh, Verlaine's uh, uh, book, the um, anthology of poems called Les Poet Modi. And in that collection, at, if I remember well, there's at least one line where he says, uh, uh, thus we will be healed by the sin. So uh, if you, combine these words, it's uh, quite uh, 
clear that the, the, the is, uh, um, heavy, that it's he heavily loaded by the religion. And um, uh, 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 every now and then, uh, taking distance between uh, uh, religion and uh, attacking also very uh, strongly against uh, all uh, uh, I think uh, the only of, of this, uh, these uh, three, uh, uh, what, whom I called it the most famous uh, uh, poet Modit, uh, really Rambo was the only one who openly said that he doesn't believe in God, but, uh, and didn't have any uh, religious conversion. But uh, what comes to uh, Baudelaire and, uh, and Verlaine, they at least they had a strong, how should I say, opinions and personal uh, thoughts about what, uh, I mean, the combination artist and God. Um, but that is that, um, should I be, um, I have to ask myself, is, does it, was it the, in the, um, in the mainly the society, when you mention, when you say God, do you say immediately also the society who believes in God? And if you are against the God, you are against the, the, the uh, uh, upper class and uh, noble classes. And uh, of course, there had to be an enemy. That's also very important in the heroic attitude of a, that time artist. Yeah, I just would like uh, to add to Boudel's um, list of uh, uh, artists exposed to occupational hazard. Uh, I would like to have there first uh, actors and musicians, as if one thinks the speed and uh, performance uh, required. Yes, yes exactly. Is, yes. Uh, just Robbie Williams is a sad example of... Uh, That's an important... Uh, I actually wanted to add to my, uh, to my list, but you know, the list would be so long, so I, so I only had to take some examples. There's a uh, uh, really um, sad... Uh, actually, a, a sad story about a uh, Finnish poet is called uh, El Onerva. You probably might know her. Some of at least the Finnish uh, persons in the audience uh, uh, who also stayed in a uh, mental hospital almost, some, I don't remember, at least almost 20, 30 years. Once again, in a shadow of uh, her famous uh, uh, composer, husband, Levi Maretoja, would be in the list. And then on the other hand, I was thinking whether I should add. Uh, you said performing, performing artists. Uh, uh, look at the young people going to see the grave of Michael Jackson today. Is he a, was he a cursed artist? One would even ask if you have to put the uh, the, the, the the whole uh, uh, discuss in the, in the contemporary context. I don't have any answer. Okay, thank you very much for your inspiring uh, presentation. And what I'm interested on, uh, what uh, kind of importance of meaning chaos and cosmos have in your own artistic work? <laughs> well, now you really put me against the wall. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it has a very important meaning. Um, as I said, I'm a, a writer and painter. I do both of them. And not to, not to be a cursed artist and not to live in a chaotic situation between these two uh, art fields, I'm trying to be a, a very disciplinated uh, artist, um, dealing my time between writing and painting so that they never uh, I, I never write and paint at the same time. The periods of uh, three months of painting and three months of writing, and that's, uh, I don't know if this is really an answer to, a, to your question, but uh, uh, I think it's, um, 
um, it's, it has something to do with it because the, the, there's probably the word uh, should I uh, uh, put the word uh, order mm. uh, against the word chaos. And so the, this, I need, I absolutely need this. It might sound very uh, unartistic, but I absolutely need uh, discipline and order. And that's, uh, uh, that certainly has something to do with uh, chaos and cos chaos and cosmos. And is there some difference how, how writing or, or painting organize your chaos? Is there some qualitative uh, differences in uh, yes. uh, making art? Yes. Uh, uh, painting is, um, in my case, and I have to say, in my case, it's, uh, it's funny to say it's almost physical activity. And uh, since I've, uh, I wrote my uh, first book, I've, I've always been writing, but my first book came out uh, as late as 2004. And the, this was, it was a revolution in my, in my personal career that I became al also a writer. So I had to think how to organize these two things. Since I, uh, some of my artist friends and colleagues uh, warned me about the, that the, uh, this, this is going to be an impossible, impossible combination. Um, but I understood quite quickly that it was only a question of uh, dealing time with. And uh, so, uh, Whereas painting is uh, almost a physical activity, uh, I don't. I mean, I'm not sitting down before my easel. Uh, I'm, I'm painting actively and uh, uh, moving around in, 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 a, in a certain space in my in my studio. And whereas when I'm writing, I'm for hours in front of my computer typing, and it's of course different. And then probably the if you say the thinking, to, p to put it very simply, uh, thinking of uh, chaos and cosmos would, would happen when, especially when writing, in that case. Uh, just a little question about, uh, about kind of daily timetable and uh, creating some intentional conditions in order to, to be as creative as possible. Uh, would you give some uh, time micromanagement examples how you work and would you give some other examples from the artists of which the routines are known? I'm going to shock you Topi. I have a I have a really I have a timetable like I would go to school when I begin my work day whether it's uh, whether it is uh, painting or writing I have a really a timetable for every day I begin uh, my days uh, I have a um, how do you call it? Munakello, the um, minuteur. I know it in French only. Egg, egg timer. Uh, when I when I have my breakfast, uh, if I'm alone or if I'm with somebody, uh, doesn't ha doesn't mind, doesn't uh, change anything. I have my uh, egg timer on the table and I put it on uh, 60 minutes. And I every morning. Uh, I, when, there's a, when I have a writing period on, I have my sketch pad on, uh, on my uh, kitchen table and uh, during those 60 minutes I may draw something that, if that comes to my mind, important things. Uh, and, but uh, when I hear the gling gling, now the 60 minutes, uh, it's over. It means that I don't. It, I stop immediately. I, I put aside my my, my uh, crayons and my my, my drawing uh, equipment, and I uh, either I go out and take a shower, and then I, at ten o'clock normally I already begin ten o'clock eleven eleven o'clock. I begin writing when it's a uh, uh, period of writing, and I stop it always at seven o'clock. Not to uh, uh, and I'm try to avoid night works, They're not working at nights. And then if I, if there's a, if I have a, um, a painting period, I'm, I'm, I'm preparing for a show. Um, the same thing, but vice versa. Uh, I have a notebook 
in which I write uh, sentences and phrases which I think that might be useful in, uh, in whatsoever in a future book or future article that I'm writing about. Um, and during 60 minutes, I uh, drink my coffee and uh, uh, write on notes. There are, of course, mornings when my head is uh, cursed and not working at all, and I don't write anything and don't. don't. But this is, uh, I'm not ashamed of this. This has, uh, it has, I have seen it during all, the, all these years that this really functions. And it's really the moment when I hear the uh, uh, egg. Um, egg timer uh, uh, ring, uh, it's, uh, I'm just about to get warm. A beautiful phrase is just about to come out, but I have to finish it. At the best, it's like, you know, uh, uh, the, is it something like if the best moment is when you still, uh, when, when, you're st when you're still not kissing, you are just about to kiss. <laughs> Can over developed self critically critically be a curse or do you have anything to comment that uh, I, no i don't think it, it i don't i personally i don't think it has anything to do with curse uh, it is very important uh, but uh, you often, if you self-criticize immediately your work whether it's writing or, or, or painting and now i'm not talking about only myself, but uh, my, my co also the work of my colleagues. Um, uh, uh, we always need a uh, little distance uh, for that. So, so uh, that also it has to happen in. A, no, I don't say in an organized um, context, but uh, self-criticism. Uh, uh, it can, of course, uh, some person, it, it can destroy you. So, uh, but if there's that, that kind of danger, I think you should, uh, uh, especially in uh, <coughs> painting, because we, a, a, a painter might be uh, even more alone with his work. Uh, we Writers, we have uh, editors and um, uh, publishing houses that help us when, when, when uh, something gets stuck. But uh, uh, painters are really, really alone. They might have uh, some uh, atelier critics, as uh, they call them, who would help them immediately. But uh, um, self, uh, any, anyhow, to, uh, to, to answer your question, to, uh, to this question, I don't think it, it, it has anything to do, or almost nothing to do, with the curse itself. Uh, Self-criticism. Uh, itself might be needed, but it has uh, dangers. There are dangers at that moment also. I learned from Professor Ruth Illman that you uh, have spent a big number of years in France, something like two decades. Yeah, m a little bit more. Ah, even more, uh, let's say, quarter of a century. So... <laughs> I'm an old cursed artist. No, no, you don't, you are not. <laughs> so, I myself are Tunisian, I am Tunisian. I come from Tunisia, and my encounter with my wife, who is Finnish lady, and with Sitting Finland. Sitting next to you. Yes, of course. Bonjour, madame. Uh, my encounter, my late encounter with Finland has been literally, really, a turning point in my life. So what I want you to tell us spontaneously you, as a Finn, going to France, highly sophisticated place. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> yes, let it come out. <laughs> I didn't, I even 
didn't ask you if you have based yourself in Paris or in Provence, but I'm sure you will tell us. Could you then uh, tell us spontaneously and frankly uh, what France has been for you, for your profile, for your life, and for your present inspiration? Well, <laughs> soon I think I will have to ask someone to say words for me because I have my, my husband here among us. <laughs> One of the reasons why I'm still staying in France. But uh, uh, going to France, uh, I left Finland in 1980, uh, during the winter 1989-90. Uh, I was uh, one of the main teachers at the Academy of Fine Arts in Helsinki. And, uh, but then you, want, you asked me to talk frankly, so I talk frankly. I saw that, uh, uh, like I would have seen a, a, a tunnel, uh, pictures of my life until the grave. Everything was clear. Uh, and it looked, uh, in a way, it looked horrible to see uh, how things were so clear. I mean, I saw the uh, supposed road I was uh, continuing on. And uh, then one day I just decided that um, I want to quit Finland, not in um, any angry manner, but uh, after several days of um, real uh, thinking about uh, what I would do and where, where I would go and so on. And then France and Paris happened to be uh, the place where I had been several times after my studies, at uh, 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 long stays at the uh, Cité des Arts in Paris. So it was, uh, I don't say, um, um, automatic. Uh, choice, but almost. I first tried, after I left the Academy of Fine Arts, I first tried and, and stayed for two years in Italy, in Rome. But something didn't function, something was not okay. So I came back to Paris and settled down in Paris uh, during the winter, 90. And I have stayed there ever since. And um, pro probably you're asking what is, uh, what, what, what France has brought into my work and uh, what's, what's the meaning uh, of, of staying there. Um, um, in spite of my personal, personal life, uh, Brahms has brought me uh, uh, a lot in my work. Uh, probably, when I left Finland, I was just a graphic artist. I only did works on paper. Fin in Finland, we have these uh, artist associations, and they are very strong. You are supposed to be either a graphic artist, a sculptor, a painter, but not all, all the three of them. Impossible. So it's very categorized. And so the, you have to be, go into one of these models. And if thinking of that, that, that I already at that time had uh, literary ambitions, it was, the combination was impossible in Finland to, to, to become true. So I just decided to change the place. And then afterwards, years later, I got the opportunity to illustrate the, uh, our national epo Kalevala. And when working at, uh, with Kalevala during three years in Paris, I understood, I really deeply understood that this is something I could not do in Finland. I, I, not only that I would be away from Finland, but the distance was really, really, really important. And now since I, uh, after uh, 2004, I, I continue on writing, I, uh, it's not an autobiography, uh, but a series of novels, 
based on my own experiences here in Finland and, uh, and different places all around the world, uh, once again I see that I could not do it anywhere else but in France. Uh, I Actually, I don't know why, but it's really... Uh, no one is asking me uh, to become, uh, become an, just a, a painter or... Uh, the, co the combination seems to be, and then what, what, what I can do, at least in France, very often I can also lie. I can tell lies. I can t <laughs> tell them, them that I'm a musician and uh, um, I'm composing a new uh, modern symphony and so on. And they, <laughs> it goes. I was quite impressed, say, horrified by your egg timer discipline, <laughs> and uh, uh, it occurred to me that is this discipline only, or is it like, uh, you know, the Oulipo, the uh, ouvroir de littérature potentielle, that if you subject yourself to strict rules, this uh, matrix of, of, uh, of restrictions will by itself sort of engender creativity? Is that part of it? No, um, in my case, it's absolutely only benefic. Okay. It's really benefic. Uh, the, the, the title of this event is uh, Chaos and Cosmos, and I know, I know it very well that if I would not go on working like this and with this same discipline, I would go towards uh, really a personal chaos. And uh, as I said, I, 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 I personally, I, I like it. I w would never... Uh, give it as a, I don't know, as a rule to any other artist, but it functions with me, it's really... Um, and it's also something that I feel, I feel so good when doing this, because I don't feel like, a, um, you know, the uh, romantic era is absolutely over in my case. And that's, um, uh, I feel like I'm trying to show what an art, artist in the future might be like, in my, in my mind. Not only... Um, well, uh, I have an um, army background. My father was an um, uh, under-officer in Finnish army and we lived in barracks in Oulu. But my father happened to be a poet also at the same time. <laughs> under-officer and a poet, so that's where I learned. And I'm really not ashamed and I, there are really benefits of uh, that kind of uh, attitude. But probably only in my case. Yes, thank you for the talk. I think uh, I feel that you asked the right questions and and basically you give the right answer also that f in order to create you don't have to suffer. But <clears throat> what happens in between is is could be, maybe be elaborated <laughs> a little bit more. I, th I think you started off <coughs> on that part by saying that well, there's differences, for example, in East and West and so forth, and, and I think what that observation pinpoints is that there's not only some personal problem with uh, ego and intention and so forth in this romantic artist ideal, but it's also a structure and a system of aesthetics that sort of tends to get artists to to uh, search for this uh, depression. <laughs> yes. And I think in order to see, to see maybe some beginning of a solution to that, uh, or to point out an alternative, I, I've read Tolstoy's writings on aesthetics. Mm. Something that's particular about those writings, it's, it's in his, late, his latest or last writings are about aesthetics, and he has, well, lived a quite typical romantic uh, writer's life with his depressions and trying to get over his depressions and so forth. Yes. But what he ends up is a, is a completely juxtaposed aesthetic theory to everything that's around at that time, I would say, and much of Western aesthetics in general. And the main point in his aesthetics is that he believes art to be a form of communication with man, and you do art for for the benefit of every man. So it's a communal practice, not a solitary, like solitary yes. practice, or not. 
and of course the rom romantic ideal is exactly this. It's a Opposite. So solitary man uh, yes. communicating with the universe, mm. not with other men or women. And I think, I think that pinpoints something about what That's it. very important. And in that case also, I um, personally feel that I'm on Tolstoy's side when, and the communication is uh, absolutely uh, more important than being alone and having communication only with the outer space or something. Um, I, I think we probably might have other interesting opinions of, of all those artists, poet, poets, filmmakers uh, and such that have uh, ju re just recently left or, or by, uh, for a reason or another their countries like Syria, uh, um, Iran, Iraq and so on. At least in France we say that the uh, amount of these artists is really increasing and their opinions would be really interesting and not, not only interesting but really valuable in such a context. What do they feel? What are their aims and their principles when they have to leave their country to enable to be to, to continue their creative activity? You mentioned uh, Eastern philosophy and the Gautama Buddha, Buddha discussed suffering and how it results from desire. And I was wondering about a different type of suffering that may occur in the creative process, because you were talking about this kind of grand, tragic suffering, but I'm thinking of a joyous suffering that, that occurs when, through self-critique, you, you set your goals, and you have to set them a bit higher than what you're achieving now in order to ever progress in your craft. So I'm wondering if maybe there is a type of suffering inherent to the creative process, but it's a joyous ki kind of suffering that you enjoy. That it, it's like, like when you're training in the gym and you have to push a bit harder and get to the next level. I, um, that, um, in my mind, is a quite complex question. I've, I think that the suffering is there, whether you want it or not. It's definitely there. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, one is writing or, or painting, uh, you compare to to uh, it, it to um, um, sports or uh, rehearsals and so on. Uh, and I almost, at least, um, I cannot talk uh, about other artists than than I in the, in the, uh, uh, with this question. Uh, but. Uh, that's how, that, that is why I also think that it's, since the suffering is there absolutely and will be there, it's, sometimes it's really difficult to, to, to write and just enjoy the uh, painting or writing. So uh, that's why I think it's also important to demystify the, 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 the useless suffering of, uh, uh, and the feeling of uh, being cursed, since we already have the... Uh, uh, the difficulty of uh, work, and uh, this, um, uh, by this we come back to, it, to my idea that one of the important, we should m more talk about the work itself, the working itself, the working itself. But uh, I think you began by, 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 uh, uh, by saying about the uh, Eastern uh, way of suffering or something like that, but I also maintain the uh, their aspect of the, the joy in, uh, uh, as a creative factory. It's really, uh, it seems to be important. I go often to Japan, I'm going next, in a couple of weeks I go back to uh, uh, Japan and uh, just to study once again the, 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 these cases of, uh, uh, my main interest in Japan is Bunraku theater and it's almost all those plays uh, written to Bunraku theater uh, about suffering and the, uh, the, the uh, idea of uh, uh, love suicides appears in uh, most of uh, uh, Chigamatsu's plays. It's my study case there. So, thank you. Wonderful music you selected. And, and then uh, it came to my mind uh, concerning the curse. It's a one profession those who write critics in newspapers and magazines, they can cause 
curse or label you to uh, forever, oh, or yes, try to label for you ever, and they have still quite much influence. I've, <laughs> I'm, yes, a really great. But they can really push you down. Yes, it's um, that is a, it's a interesting. Well, um, um, it would be nice to uh, really. We were talking about uh, intentional and uninten unintentional curse. Uh, I would like to know myself on which side I would put the art critics. Uh, <laughs> I cannot invite them to write uh, uh, good things about me or bad things or, or uh, kill me with their articles and um, also get good tri critics. Of it. It's really um, um, thank you for reminding us of the, that fact. It's really. And that will still uh, still continue. I mean, it's not we were talking so much about past things, but that's uh, our everyday life today. At this point, I would like to extend a warm thank you to the audience who has engaged so lively in this discussion, and thank you, Hannu, for taking the time to engage with the audience. Also, I think it's wonderful that we have really time to to convert co conversations also at this Abuagora event. So please let us give a big round of applause for Hannu Weisanen.